Thank you very much, Tomani. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for coming to our session and to this new event. Um, I'm very excited to present, you know, our you know, findings and the stories, you know, behind you know the data. Um, this you know, whole you know project started mainly because uh, three years ago, when the national agricultural policy was being drafted. Of all the uh, consultative state, uh, multi-stakeholder consultative you know, meetings that was done in preparation for the national agricultural policy, the main message was that agriculture extension was coming out as the major constraint and uh, was coming out as the major uh, and having the potential to increase productivity and get us to the agricultural transformation and agricultural development that we are aiming for. So we started with this project um, three years you know, ago, and um, I have you know, presented you know, this in several of uh, the events. What I will be presenting are the results of the completed studies, but many more are ongoing, so some of what I will be presenting are the preliminary results. And I really look forward to discussions and debating the stories, the figures, and the findings you know, from this you know, research. Treat it not as a dissemination, but treat it as a validation and discussion of the results, that we, so that we are all part of the process that Tamani was talking about. Okay. So the pluralistic extension you know, project started uh, in 2016 with funding from the government of Flanders, with contributions from GIZ, and also USAID SANE project, and the CGIAR, policies, institutions, and markets. So the main objective was to provide evidence-based policy and strategy support to help coordinate and revitalize the pluralistic agricultural extension services provision in Malawi. And the specific objectives of our new project was one, assess the current status of demand for and supply of services, to monitor progress of key indicators over time, to identify approaches and interventions that worked or didn't work, and lastly, to inform the extension policy and strategy development that is ongoing. So under the project, we have collected several data sets you know, from various you know, organizations and all the districts in the country. So we have two rounds of household and community level you know, surveys. These are nationally representative, covering 3,100 you know, house, 3, households in 299 sections in all the districts, 29 districts you know, excluding uh, Likoma. So this is the distribution of the sampled you know, households per district. So in each of the districts, the number or the sample size per district is proportional to the size of the district. So that each individual or each you know, household has equal probability of being selected in the sample. You can you know, see here that there are you know, districts that are uh, more because it's a bigger, it's bigger size for the district. Uh, Salina came and uh, want to also piggyback and you know use the data set for the monitoring and evaluation for the SANE. So we increased because of that additional funding, we increased the sample size in the Feed the Future you know, districts um, to enable district level uh, analysis in the Feed the Future USAID you know, projects. To so maintain the national representativeness of the data in all our analysis, descriptive, qualitative, and quantitative you know, analysis, we had to put weights so that we put less weights to those you know, oversampled Feed the Future you know, districts and higher weights for the samples that are not Feed the Future you know, districts so that we maintain the representativeness of the data at the national level. So in addition to the household you know, surveys, we also had a census of all state and non-state service you know, providers in 15 you know, districts. And the 15 districts are shown you know, here. It's representative across you know, regions, across ADDs, and across agro-economic agro 
quite uh, uh, systems. In addition you know, to that, we also had in-depth you know, interviews of you know, lead farmers in same some fall communities where we had the household you know, survey. So we had in-depth you know, interviews with 531 lead farmers in same communities so that we can compare what's you know, going on, how are they performing, and how are they interacting with other you know, farmers in the same you know, households where we did the household and community surveys. In addition to that, we did a series of in-depth you know, interviews, we did focus group discussions, and we have also access to the data on the different you know, DAES structures, starting with the VAX, a, um, ASPs, DSPs, that is a lot of acronyms, that, uh, that act and also you know, that. We have also access to those you know, type of information. So this is the level and the nature and the, the um, in, um, intensity of you know, the data, the richness of the data that we are using for our analysis. So with that you know, data, what are we finding as the positive you know, trends? There are many you know, good news, number one, we are finding the data that there's high coverage of extension services. Much you know, higher than most countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Comparable to Ethiopia, and much you know, higher than Uganda. Two countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that invested a lot and made a lot of reforms in their agriculture extension system. So that's really good news. The second good news is that there are improvements in access to extension services for both women and men and also for both youth and non-youth. So that's second accomplishments. The third is that there's consistently high ratings when you ask you know, farmers about the usefulness and satisfaction on extension of services. The fourth is that we are seeing more diversity of extension messaging. Now we're not just focusing on agricultural production, but we are seeing more messaging on markets, market access, climate change, and environment, and nutrition. The fifth, the positive you know, trend is that there are greater use of cost-effective you know, tools and delivery methods, such as the use of radio programming, you know, for example, and the use of community and group you know, approaches to deliver and you know, to diffuse the information faster to the communities at a lower cost. And the last positive trend that we are seeing is that we are seeing greater crop diversification. Uh, moving away from maize and tobacco and in more into legumes and other crops. Although the rate of change is you know, so far slow. Now, um, I will be giving you details you know, to provide you know, some evidence and provide details to those general trends that I just represented. So I will be showing you a few graphs. So in each of these graphs, graphs, take note that these are national level. So it's not specific to a district that you are working on. It's not specific to a project or program that you are working on. These are all national level because we want you know, to see what's the performance of extension services provided by the pluralistic system, not by government only, not by non-government you know, only, but uh, provision of extension uh, uh, provision of extension services as a whole. So all these are at the national you know, level. And in most of the crops that I will be presenting, I will be presenting 2016 and 2018. So two periods of you know, data. So let's start with this one. This you know, graph you know, shows the percentage of households receiving information on agricultural plants. Again, it's not specific to any source. It's not only from the government, it's not from the non-government, but cumulatively. And in all of the graphs, most of the graphs, uh, I, I am presenting in percentage of households. So all, in almost all the graphs that I will be presenting, it's the percentage of you know, the households that we were sorting. So in here, um, the first you know, set is the cumulative of all the different you know, topics. You can see here that 77% of the households have received agricultural information in the last you know, two years. 54% received agricultural advice in the last you know, 12 you know, months. These are comparable to that of Ethiopia. Ethiopia, major investments, major reforms in the agricultural extension you know, system. Uh, they are reaching 70, 71% of their households with agricultural information. 
In Uganda, I'm sure you have heard of NADS. I'm sure you have heard of the reforms. Even in Uganda, that made in a lot of reforms, they are reaching 12% of you know, households with agricultural information. Um, agricultural information on nutrition is increasing. Information on markets is increasing. Information on climate change is increasing. Moving on. In terms of source, Still, the major source of information are the government extension workers, the EDOs and the EDICs. But go, coming you know, closely is you know, from radio messaging. So I think they made you know, re really you know, good contributions in terms of reaching out a lot of you know, people, especially in the remote areas. The third is you know, the field officers or extension workers from the NGOs. The fourth are just sharing uh, information from farmer to farmer. Other farmers, neighbors, you know, friends, they're getting information from their neighbors. And the uh, lead, you know, farmer, heavily promoted, you know, by the government. But we are, you know, seeing that there's not, you know, much coverage. When we ask, you know, the farmers, did you get information? Did you get advice from lead farmers, those, you know, trained uh, by government or non, you know, government to train other farmers in the communities on specific, you know, technologies? We didn't see you know, much you know, coverage in terms of the leading farmers. Moving on, in terms of method or approach, um, we are you know, seeing that radio is the widely used method or approach in delivering information. 47% you know, said you know, they have you know, received information through radio. The second is community and group you know, meetings. That's the second most popular tool that's used in receiving information. The third is face-to-face, -face, still the face-to-face -face, you know, visits with, you know, with uh, agents to the farmers or to their farms. Farm demonstrations is still used, but not you know, so much. But you know, there are also you know, uh, households that are getting information from these structures, the VACs and the DACs. There are plenty of different tools that are being you know, used by you, by different you know, programs, by different you know, organizations. The coverage when we see at the national level is not much, but you know, the where there's you know, large you know, coverage is through the radio, community you know, meetings, and face-to-face uh, um, -face, you know, uh, interactions with the farmers. Moving on, gender parity. We talk a lot about gender, we talk about you know, youth. So what are we, how are we doing in terms of uh, extension you know, services? The unique feature of our data set is that we collected individual respondents. We collected male and fe we collected information from male and female respondents in the household. So we are not just you know, looking at female-headed households versus male-headed households, where for those of you who are working on gender, familiar with gender, there's a lot of limitations or issues with that type of with, with that type of dichotomy. So we look at females, we look at women and men within the households. And we look also at the female-headed in you know, households. Are women you know, receiving more information than men or vice you know, versa? So we are you know, seeing here, and we also you know, look at you. And what we are seeing here as the trend is that there's still some gap. Around 55, 60% of women are receiving information compared to around you know, 72, 73% of men receiving information. But we have made already a huge you know, progress Starting from, you know, for example, the time 10 years ago when I was, you know, starting to look at gender issues in Malawi, gender issues and, you know, extension services, where the gaps were, you know, huge, where the gaps are from the range of, you know, 30 to 50 percent, you know, gap between women and men receiving information. So there's, even though there's still, you know, some gap, there's already a huge uh, achievement in terms of slowly closing this house. So I think that's another you know, achievement in the system. In terms of quality of services, it's hard to define, right? You know, how do we measure? Measuring you know, quality of services is you know, a difficult thing. But from the, uh, from the context of you know, surveys, we can you know, ask you know, questions and uh, use you know, life value scale to get an indication of their subjective rating of the extension service providers. So we ask you know, five you know, questions. First is, 
were you satisfied with the advice? We asked you know, the farmers. And they can answer not, not satisfied, somewhat satisfied, satisfied, very satisfied. And these are the results, right? Which is the first you know, box. So majority are saying they're very satisfied. 65% are saying they're very satisfied. 32% are saying they are you know, satisfied. And only 30% you know, are saying they're not you know, satisfied. There's a little bit of decline over the years, but overall, there's high rating in terms of you know, subjective you know, rating of farmers in terms of the extension of the services that they get. Another question is, was the advice you know, useful? Again, similar results, high you know, ratings. We also ask, did you act upon or did you follow the advice? Majority said, said they followed. Um, was it something that you needed or you wanted? Again, you know, they say it's something that uh, I wanted. So the sense that you know we, we are getting is either they are just you know polite and just you know saying yes, you know it's for free anyways, so we cannot say no, otherwise we will not you know get the free extension trail business anymore. Or you know we can also you know believe that you know that's really you know the case. But as I you know go on with my presentation, maybe it's the first one rather than the second one that I mentioned. But what we are seeing is that in terms of you know, people demanding information or requesting information, that, that's the last uh, set of inquiries, that not many people are demanding or requesting information. In 2016, 12% are requesting or demanding information. It dropped in 2018, only 4% of you know, households are demanding or requesting information. Again, you know, this implies you know, a lot in terms of you know, the vision of a demand for freedom extension. Okay, moving to the not so good trends and areas where we need improvement. So we see huge coverage of extension services and that extension services le led to greater technology awareness. But that extension services and greater awareness didn't seem to translate to greater adoption of the technologies that are being you know, promoted. We see that adoption of most of the soil, water, and land management practices, you know, for example, remains very low. And that there's still a huge gap between those who are aware of the technologies and those that are actually adopting those technologies. And as Tamani has also you know, mentioned in his, in his remarks that we are still you know, seeing farm productivity low and even declining, and even the commercialization. The NAP and the NAIF are, in, are, in, are emphasizing a lot on the commercialization, but we are seeing low and declining tre trends in commercialization. And I'll give you some details of the trends that I just presented. Overall, this is what we are seeing in terms of um, technology awareness. And how are we defining you know, awareness? It's a question in the questionnaire saying, are you aware or have you have, do you have knowledge in this particular technology? And then we enumerate the different you know, technologies that we are interested in. But the general trend is that there's high awareness in almost all of the technologies. Fifth, almost majority of the households are aware of the technology. And it's increasing from 2016 to 2018. Not much of an issue here. Moving on to the uh, adoption of technology. We are you know, seeing that in most of the technologies, it's improving. We can you know, see the improvement from the dark, the dark you know, bar to the light you know, bar. So there's improvement in some of the technologies, although there's also decline in some of the te technologies. For example, the soil you know, cover and pit planting declined from 2016 to 2018 uh, um, of you know, adoption rates of uh, households. And we are you know, seeing that in most of the technologies, it's still very low. Um, soil you know, cover, we are seeing 6% of the households are adopting it. Pit planting, again, 6% you know, of the households are you know, adopting it. So when we compare the awareness and the adoption of the technologies, let's just you know, look at you know, across you know, the board. There's huge gap. 
those who are aware versus those who are actually adapting huge gaps. Latino zero in on the soil you know, cover, for example. 49% of the households said they are aware, they have knowledge about these technologies, but only 6% are adapting. So wh what we are you know, trying to do is going further and analyzing further what, what explains this gap. Is it the quality and intensity of extension services that we are you know, providing? Or we have also you know, to question, are the technologies that we are you know, promoting really good, profitable, and productive you know, technologies that would help you know, the farmers? Maybe those are the reasons why they are not you know, adapting. But in overall, you know, the study, I think you know, this is one of our major you know, findings, that if we could you know, debate, discuss, get you know, insights from our projects, why this is happening, I think we could do uh, a lot in terms of you know, moving us forward to not just awareness, but also adoption, actual adoption of the technologies that we are promoting. Here, I think it's not a surprise you know, for you, like uh, productivity in terms of you know, yields per you know, hectare, it's decreasing in most of you know, the, the crops. Of course, there are many you know, reasons from climate to other you know, things, but we are seeing declining you know, productivity in almost all, 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 all of the crops. Commercialization. Commercialization we're defining as the percentage of your production, your harvest that you sow. So this is you know, the graph, oh, oh, if you know, say. That in maize, on average, the households are se selling 5% of their maize you know, production. And it's declining from 2016 to 2018. Even for you know, the, the crops that we are hoping to promote under crop diversification, um, beans, um, groundnuts, you know, vegetables, people are not selling. Um, groundnuts, you know, 21% of their production goes to the market, you know, others in the market. A lot of this can be explained by the productivity. They're not producing enough. They're not being productive enough to produce, you know, surplus. Therefore, they would have not, you know, enough to sell to the market. That could also be an explanation. But these are the general trends, you know, from the data. Now, um, now moving you know, forward to move, moving now from the general description of the data. We also did you know, studies, detailed you know, studies that look at effectiveness. So we are trying to search, you know, are there pockets of successes? And are there you know, approaches or areas where it's working or not you know, working? So we're trying to see areas where there's some positive you know, impacts in the th things you know, we do. So in, a, in an ideal world, as a researcher, I think you know, uh, some of us you know, here are, are, are researchers and doing monitoring and evaluation of our you know, projects. In an ideal world, we would you know, work with projects and we would randomize the intervention so that you know, like, uh, randomly, we're not picky, uh, cherry picking, but you know, half, you know, for example, you know, gets intervention, the other half doesn't get the intervention. And then we measure the change over time in the you know, two groups, and we measure the impact. That ideally, you know, like that's the best you know, scenario. A second scenario is that we couldn't you know, randomize, but we still work with you know, projects wherein we look at the beneficiaries, we uh, do a survey or collect data from a comparative, uh, comparable control group, and we look at the changes over time and compare you know, what's going on with these beneficiaries and, not, and control group, and that's where we see you know, impact. The third best you know, scenario is when it's not you know, available and it's not you know, possible, we look at panel data, which we do have. So the idea is really look at who got the information from this you know, panel you know, data. Um, and uh, for example, the intervention that we are interested in, in here is you know, the training or the extension services. And look also of those ones that didn't get that inter intervention. And we use you know, statistical you know, methods such as matching or fixed you know, methods, fixed you know, effects you know, methods, to make sure that we are comparing apples to apples. We are comparing same group of you know, people for those that are treatment and for those that are control unit. And then we do the difference, we see the changes over time, and then we analyze you know, the data. So the first, and the second uh, choices or scenarios were not available for us. 
So we work on our data set to see what's going on with those that got extension services and those that didn't get extension in the services. So we looked at the panel data and we complemented it with the numerous you know, field um, uh, work that we did and the focus group discussions that we did and the in-depth you know, interviews that we did. So we've done as rigorously as we can in terms of analyzing this data so that, that we can look at you know, these pockets of successes and we looked at you know, where you know, some you know, positive impacts are happening. So the first one that we are trying to answer, at the national level, again, all of these things are the national level. It doesn't uh, pinpoint or zero in a specific you know, district or a project or a program that you're working on. All are at the national you know, level. So at the national level, we are trying to ask, does access to extension your services have an impact on technology adoption and other development you know, outcomes, productivity and food security, for example? So I've explained, you know, we are looking at the households that got no extension services, and we're comparing it with those that got extension services. Did it matter? For those who got extension services, they did, did they get higher tech, um, technology adoption? And did they get you know, higher productivity and food security? So what, did, what are you finding? We didn't find any statistical significance. Therefore, it didn't matter whether a household got extension services or didn't get extension services. Again, that's on the average, that's average effects at the national level. So we are you know, trying to understand, you know, uh, um, can we see where it's you know, working? So we were trying to unpack those people who got extension services. If we try to unpack and disaggregate and see those who got Better advice, meaning they're saying that it's very good advice, versus those that are saying that they, go, they got good advice, as opposed to those that are receiving not you know, good advice. We're trying to disaggregate or unpack those who receive information uh, services uh, based on what the reported quality of the extension services. So did it matter for those who are receiving high quality information did it make a difference in terms of their technology adoption and in their productivity and food security? What did we find? We see positive effects. That those who are receiving very good advice, they have a greater likelihood of adopting the technologies and they have a greater you know, likelihood of you know, getting higher productivity and food security. Another study that we did is a particular case of pit planting where we measured their knowledge. So pit planting is an intensive technology where you know, there are certain dimensions that you have to follow, depth, and also the spacing of the maize and you know, crops, and also the use of organic purposes, you know, chemical you know, fertilizers. So we measured the knowledge of the lead farmers, other farmers, and extension you know, workers. So we have a knowledge score. So the one is, you know, very poor knowledge in terms of you know like pig planting, and six is the highest, wherein they have you know good knowledge in terms of you know pig planting. And what we are see, what we are you know trying to see is that does the knowledge, does the knowledge for uh, have you know something to do with higher for higher adoption? If they have more knowledge, that does it translate to higher adoption? And our studies you know showing that yes, for those who have higher knowledge scores, it's uh, affecting or you know, making an impact in terms of you know, technology adoption, in particular pig planting. So what we're seeing, that the access to quality advice and greater intensity of knowledge have an impact on adoption of technologies and have an impact on productivity and food you know, security. The thing that we couldn't decipher uh, in our studies that um, does the quality of extension you know, mean more intense you know, training, more intensive training, uh, or does the quality of uh, information has to do with the nature of the technology? So we couldn't you know, identify this in the study. It could be for our future research, and it could be a discussion where we can bring in our experiences and our, research, our own research in this area. Another uh, research question that we are trying to address is, at the national level, does access to extension you know, services 
the type, the different you know, types and sources of extension you know, services have an impact on crop diversification or income diversification or dietary diversity. These are the outcome variables that we are very much you know, interested in. And the NAP and the NAEP are into this you know, outcome you know, variables, outcome variables. So what are we finding? Again, we are you know, looking at comparing those who receive extension services versus those that didn't receive extension ser uh, services. Those who received and those who didn't receive. Did it make a difference? Um, we are trying to unpack. When we unpack those who receive extension ser <coughs> services, what we are seeing is those who receive the, the extension services from radio programming compared to the other sources, it makes a difference in their dietary diversity of the household. <coughs> so we see some impact if the information is received you know, from radio. We didn't see this impact in the other sources. The other that one that we looked at is, if in general, there's no effect on technology <coughs> adoption, are there particular technologies where we see some you know, impact if we unpack the different you know, sources? So again, we are seeing some impact of the advice being received from radio programming and other farmers and there's a positive impact on the adoption of organic fertilizer. Individually, uh, uh, um, advice received from the radio has an impact. Individually, uh, advice you know, gotten from other farmers has an impact on organic you know, fertilizer you know, adoption. But jointly, if you know, they got advice from radio plus you know, other farmers, it makes greater impact. The third that we looked at is um, crop residue incorporation, where we are seeing some impact. <coughs> so if farmers have received extension services from government, uh, or lead farmer, or other farmers, we see significant you know, effect in their likelihood and intensity of adoption of crop residue um, incorporation. The fourth that we looked at is income diversification. And income diversification, we are measuring as the number of distinct you know, income sources that household have. For example, if they have you know, crop income, it's counted as one. If they have you know, livestock income, it's counted you know, as two, and so forth. Over the total income that the household you know, gets. That's how we are measuring income diversification. So we are seeing that if they get extension you know, advice from the government, or from the uh, uh, private or NGO you know, extension and other you know, farmers, we see some impact on income diversification. That that extension services or that agriculture information is leading them to increase the diversity of you know, their income. And they're moving towards selling more of their crops and you know, selling more of their livestock. And the last that we have you know, looked at is crop diversification. So, Private and NGO you know, extension, and when you combine it with marketing extension, it makes a difference and it leads to more impact in crop diversification, but not in other things. So what are we finding? That adoption of your know, technologies is responsive to extension service provision. We have just seen that in organic, you know, organic uh, fertilizer use and crop residue incorporation, that providing more extension you know, services really made an impact. It just you know, shows that in some of the technologies, in, there's information barrier. And through provision of the extension you know, services, we can influence greater adoption in these you know, technologies. The second is that what, what we are you know, seeing is that delivery tool or method and source, and source of information matters um, in terms of you know, impact. We are seeing that in radio you know, programming, there's some impact in some of the technologies. In some you know, cases, the government, uh, when combined with you know, lead farmers and other farmers, it makes you know, some uh, 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 impact. And also, combining the different you know, approaches, like for example, combining uh, the government extension with the lead you know, farmer and other you know, farmers, combining those you know, approaches because the more you hear from other sources, the more you hear from you know, other you know, methods, it uh, just you know, intensifies 
the information that you are interested in. And the fourth that we are, you know, try, uh, that we are, you know, finding is that the topic of extension services matters. That when you just, you know, combine marketing extension, uh, combining it with the usual that we do on that focuses on agricultural production, uh, intensifying more of the marketing in, in uh, extension can, you know, have, you know, significant and huge you know, impacts in terms of increasing technology adoption and the development of you know, outcomes that we are interested. Okay, lead farmer is uh, the topic that I will be discussing uh, next. And the question is, at the national level, does farmer exposure to lead you know, farmers have an impact on technology adoption? So are we seeing you know, some you know, impact of the lead you know, farmer you know, approach? Lead farmer approach has been promoted um, a lot, and a lot of the organizations are working on the lead farmer. The official figure is that you know, there's tw 23 to 1 farmer to lead farmer ratio. So that you know, means you know, around 200,000 200, know, fa farmers or more available in the system. When we, when we did our own census of uh, service providers or our own interviews with the Dados and different you know, stakeholders, we got a much you know, lower you know, value. Uh, what we are you know, getting is on the average, you know, uh, a district has you know, around 1,700 you know, lead farmers. So we are you know, getting less than um, than the 23 to 1, you know, lead, you know, uh, farmer to lead farmer innovation. But, the, 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 but that's just, you know, a minor, a minor point. The major point here really is that if there's so many lead farmers in the country, in all the districts and many of the communities, how are they performing? Do we see uh, this, you know, greater provision of information in the community? And can we see greater adoption of the technologies being you know, promoted because we, uh, we have you know, lead farmers there? So that uh, motivated us you know, to do uh, more on this, you know, on this uh, topic. So we are comparing those you know, communities with no lead farmers and those communities with lead farmers. We are also uh, trying to see of those communities that has more lead farmers, you know, it, that, does it make a difference? Um, in terms of adoption of technologies of the household of those you know, communities um, of the technologies that are being used. What we are, what we are seeing is that on average at the national level, it didn't make a difference. So there's no difference between the communities with lead farmers and the communities without you know, lead farmers. We did more analysis. So we are comparing you know, farmers that don't know um, any lead farmer and farmers who know some you know, lead farmers. And we change it, we vary it um, to also you know, look at does it matter if you know more lead farmers in the community? Our finding is also negative, meaning it didn't matter. Farm, farmers knowing more lead farmers or farmers not knowing anybody or farmers you know, knowing more lead farmers. It didn't make a difference in terms of the actual technology adoption. And lastly, we also you know, looked at farmers, whether they received information or advice from lead farmers, comparing it with the farmers that did not receive information from lead farmers, did it make a difference? Again, it didn't make any difference. So no matter you know, what uh, analysis or what indicators we use, it seems to indicate that overall, at the national level, it doesn't you know, make a, dif a difference, whether there's lead farmer there or you interacted with a lead farmer, and how you are changing your behavior in terms of technologies you know. So we further unpacked, because in the focus group discussions that we did, there's a lot of variability in the communities. There are some communities wherein the lead farmers are very well respected. There are some in the communities wherein they say lead farmers are working in America. But in other also communities where we did the focus group discussions, it's also the opposite. That the lead farmers are not well you know, respected, the, the selection was not you know, transparent, and you know, they even are not you know, recognized or not valued in the community. There's also you know, some jealousy and envy because it was not done in a uh, transparent and um, tra participatory way in the community. So motivated by that uh, diversity of communities 
and the performance of lead performers from the focus group discussion that we did. We tried to unpack, you know, again. So for the communities where lead farmers were regularly trained, for those communities, then it's strongly associated with technology adoption in that community. So those communities with regularly trained lead farmers, we see higher technology adoption in that community. Those communities where lead farmers are well respected versus those communities uh, where they said the lead farmers were not respected, we see a uh, strong association with, the, with technology adoption. Those communities with well-respected lead farmers have greater technology adoption. And lastly, um, communities where lead farmers are adopting the technologies that uh, they promote, we see again association with technology adoption. So for the lead you know, farmers, they are trained of a particular one or two technologies. But the data that we are you know, seeing is that not all of them, actually majority of them, have not adopted the technology that they have been you know, using. So it's hard if you know, someone who is teaching you about the technology has not adopted the technology. So that's basically what we are you know, seeing here. That in communities where the lead farmers are adopting the technology, we see that you know, farmers are also you know, following and also adopting the technology. So what our takeaway message is that for the lead farmer approach that's heavily you know, promoted, um, regular training of lead farmers is needed. Support from the AIDOs uh, and the community leaders are needed. And that there should be a transparent and participatory selection in the process. We should do a lot more of that. And there should be greater uh, community sensitization and recognition of the value of the lead farmers. Moving on. At the national level, we're also you know, trying to ask the question, does participation in the village agricultural committees have an impact on technology adoption? Um, again, it's the same framework. It's the same you know, methodology. We are comparing those households that did not participate in the VACs versus those who participated in the VACs. Did it make a difference in terms of you know, their behavioral change or more gearing towards you know, adopting the, pro the technologies that are being used. And we see impact. So if we can increase and promote you know, participation in this in VAX, it can make a difference in terms of uh, 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 motivating farmers to adopt the technologies that are being used. The second one that we did is comparing communities that didn't have VAX and communities with VAX. So have, we didn't find any difference. Those communities with VACs set up, the village agricultural committees, and those that didn't have uh, VACs or the village agricultural committees, we didn't see any association with uh, e either one of them having greater or less technology adoption. We unpacked it. Uh, again, you know, we're looking at um, certain you know, studies that uh, look at the functionality of these different you know, VACs and the different you know, structures. That they are very varied. That maybe we're not seeing at the, at the, at the average because of you know, the diversity of them. So we try to unpack. For those that are rated active VACs, do we see greater adoption of technology in these new communities? And the answer that we are getting is yes. For the VACs, for the communities with active VACs, there's impact in terms of technology adoption. For communities with the responsive you know, VACs, there's impact in technology you know, adoption. And for communities that have strong grassroots groups or grassroots organizations, we see impact in terms of technology adoption. We've also looked at model village uh, concepts. Again, this is another approach that has been heavily you know, promoted by, by the government. Village, model village is an approach that involves participatory extension methods that is aimed to empower the community, empower the households and the individuals in it, so that they can design and implement uh, integrated approaches and partnerships. 
so that you know they can you know improve the outcomes in the community. That's model village plan. It started in 2006, um, and has been you know, slowly being implemented. So we compared you know the, the, the communities, those that have started this this approach, the model village approach, and the communities where it hasn't even started. Do we see difference in terms of people adapting technologies or not? And our findings you know, say that it didn't matter. The villages who have started or that started the model village, it didn't, you know, it didn't make a difference in terms of people adapting the technologies than those communities that didn't you know, adapt. So we have tried to unpack again, where can this work? the model in a village. So what we are you know, seeing is in those communities where, where the model village you know, approach has started and where there is strong grassroots organization there, then we are you know, seeing some impact in the technology adoption. So overall, we are seeing these effects because many of the backs are still not active. It's diverse. There are many also that are active, but the you know, majority are still not active. They've never met or they've just you know, met once. And for uh, model village, we're not seeing impact overall uh, because it just you know, started. In most of the focus group discussions that we had with the model village, uh, uh, model village the process is just you know, starting. There's a process that they need to follow so that they could be model in you know, the village. So in most of them, they're just in the sensitization stage. In some of them, they have been already developed their action plans. But beyond that, nothing yet is seen happening. That's why we're seeing no impact on the overall. So my takeaway is that, just from this you know, slide, that the implication is that in the short run, we are seeing that for those well-functioning structures, you know, they're making an impact, you know, right? So the short-term implication is that we should, you know, we should you know, continue or we should intensify their support you know, for this because if, you, if we make them active, if we make them functional, then we can you know, see some impact. But in the long run, I'm also you know, questioning that you know, implication. In the long run, we are you know, also you know, seeing that um, these are pockets of successes. It's still, it's still exemptions rather than rules. This you know, functioning you know, systems and those that are working you know, very well, these are still minorities rather than majority. That's why if you look at overall, you don't unpack, but overall, extension services, lead farmer, VAX, or model village, if you're just looking at the overall, there's no impact because majority is still the not functioning one and the minority are the functioning one. So it makes us you know, question how long do we have you know, to wait? Or how long do we really need or what's you know, required to make you know, these structures or these approaches you know, working? Do we have you know, to wait for five years, 10 years, or so forth? So we're still you know, seeing this small minority um, pockets of successes. But we still have a long way to go to make them the majority, to make them the rule rather than the exceptions. So we're seeing pockets, pockets of successes. But how can we replicate them fast? How can we scale them fast? So we're thinking of accelerating. We are only you know, seeing the small, small impacts for those structures or for those you know, approaches that work. But majority or overall, a lot of these things are not working. So how, what can we do to accelerate the process? How can we We'll make sure that you know, we replicate and scale up those who are you know, or that those you know approaches or uh, structures that are working well, and how do we do it in the past? So acceleration. Can we think of accelerators so that you know we don't have to wait for you know many years for them to catch up or them, for them you know to work? But how can we hasten the process? So we don't have you know all the you know answers. We have you know some you know insights. But it's a question that I pose to everyone because we are all working in this you know, same universe. So why are we seeing this you know, effects? We are looking at the supply side, right? We have you know, census of you know, service you know, providers. Uh, of the census you know, providers that we have you know, interviewed, there's really pluralism in the system. 
we have in the 15 districts that we went, uh, 121 different service providers from the government and non union government. In a typical villa, in, in a typical district, this is what you see as the distribution of the service union providers. In a typical district, you can see government there working, um, uh, different you know, international organizations, you know, 31% uh, international organizations, 31% you know, local organizations. There are also in the private sector you know, working, um, NASPAM is also working and so forth. So a lot of different you know, organizations working in the district. It can go to, it, it, it's also you know, diverse. Uh, for example, Chiran Sula, only six, 25 in Balaka, but it can also you know, go, go, go as much as 35% you know, percent, uh, 35 you know, service unit providers in, uh, in the law. So there's this amount of you know, and number of service that, uh, providers that we are dealing with. Sometimes you know, there are conflicting messages, but it just you know, indicates the need for coordination and harmonization of the different you know, messages that we are providing to the partners. In terms of you know, human resources, again, it was very difficult you know, to get you know, information and you know, data. But what we are seeing is that it's not only now in you know, government, but non you know, government are very active. That the data we are getting is one to one ratio. That one is you know, the government technical you know, staff, and there's also you know, one correspondence to technical staff that are in the non you know, government organizations as one, as an aggregate. In terms of field officers or in terms of extension you know, um, uh, workers, we are getting a two to one you know, ratio, wherein two is still you know, the government, but there's also 50% of you know, field officers and extension you know, workers available you know, there. So human capacity is there. We're just not talking about the government, but huge uh, number of uh, extension workers and field officers you know, from the, the non-governmental organizations. But what was also interesting and a bit you know, surprising is that these organizations are working in silos. All the AIDOs you know, said they work with the non-government you know, organizations, and the non-government you know, organizations, private sector, you know, work with the AIDOs. So there's this you know, more working together in the ground than what we initially, or what we have you know, thought of, or what's you know, uh, usually you know, reported. So there's still you know, this focus on the farmer to extension agent you know, ratio, right? that um, uh, the perception is, you know, once we get to this, you know, like ratio that's optimal, then we can get, you know, like this extension, you know, services going and making an impact. But just to show you that if we include the agricultural extension service uh, providers from the non-government, we are already, you know, talking of high uh, or low farmer to extension, you know, agent ratio, 1,000, 500 farmers being uh, provided or supported by one extension you know, officer from the government or non government. So I don't see this much of an issue now. In Malawi, the, the figures are higher than most you know, countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's not an issue. The only country where farmer to extension agent ratio is better in Malawi is in Ethiopia and, uh, and Kenya. But Malawi, you're good. So we should you know, go away from the focus of farmer to extension you know, agent as our performance you know, measure, but move you know, forward and not you know, looking just at this, at this input you know, matrix, but really seeing whether that extension your know, services have impacted or made a difference in technology adoption and development of the agriculture sector. In terms of gender, um, <coughs> Um, roughly uh, 19 um, or 25 percent are female um, extension you know, agents and technical officers. Again, you know we could do a lot more, but this is already you know um, higher than most you know, African you know, countries. But what I want to highlight is that because of this you know, pluralism, many different you know, organizations you know, working. Um, there's many different you know trainings you know going, but largely un are unfortunate. So we could do a lot more in terms of coordinating these different you know, activities. If you ask you know, extension you know, agents, 
40 to 60 percent had not you know, received any retraining in the last you know, three years. So that's major you know, gap in terms of you know, capacity and updating of their you know, skills. So what's needed is a training, so you know, need you know, assessment, and uh, it has to be done in the context of pluralism and complementarity. So there's a lot of you know, training you know, being you know, promoted, but largely uncoordinated. So we could do a lot of more important things. Um, lastly, On the supply you know, side, I want you to emphasize three things. Funding first, the second is performance targets that we are using, and the third is capacity to implement and scale up these activities. On the funding, we tried you know, very hard you know, to get you know, the data, but it's, it's hard you know, to get information on funding from the non-government side. So we were un unsuccessful to get funding on extension services from the non-government you know, service providers. So we don't have you know, the data. From the government, it's also you know, difficult you know, to get, but we have you know, some figures. At the 15 districts that we went, uh, most of the budget uh, is you know, going to the salaries, and only very little is going to the actual extension you know, services. The, the figures that we are getting, it's not perfect, because it's hard to estimate what really goes to extension, as opposed to the other crops, as opposed you know, to the lifestyle. The, but the best estimate that we are you know, getting is around 700,000 uh, quadra per agent and 244, um, uh, 244, 250 quadra per farmer. You know, so there's not much. This is per year. This is you know, providing extension new services you know, to, to the farmers from the extension new agency per year. So that's you know, very good. We can say that a lot of you know, projects are there because we, we don't have you know, the data at the project you know, of the different uh, NGOs and private sector that are working. But those come and go. Yeah, those are ad hoc and you know, short term. What we are emphasizing is you know, we need you know, more stable funding for the government, not on the salary per se, but more of the operating cost to do really extension services. On the performance target, I think a lot of the issues, you know, really is the still focus on the main input matrix. At the national level, a major indica indicator that we are still, you know, following is the farmer to extension agent ratio or farmer to lead farmer ratio. At the project level or organization level, we are still measuring, we're still counting the number of, you know, trainees. Most of the service you know, providers that we have you know, interviewed and AIDOs that we interviewed, we are still using number of you know, trainees as you know, our indicator. We have to move beyond that and really measure of the outcome. What are we you know, getting in terms of the training and the number of you know, trainees that we are you know, getting? Um, and with this you know, performance you know, targets, if we have you know, targets that are based on you know, outcome, Perhaps, you know, as a system, we could, you know, utilize the potential of technology, <coughs> potential of, you know, ICT, wherein we could get, you know, data, you don't need IFPRI to do it, but develop, you know, a system where you can, you know, collect your own data, analyze it at the district, you know, level, you know, for example, to get frequent updates on a status of extension, you know, services, trainings, you know, provided, videos, you know, like looked at, and seeing and linking it to different uh, indicators such as yield, productivity, food security, and so forth. You can even bring in this big, you know, data analytics where you can, you know, put in information on soils, you know, climates, so that those, you know, information are given to different, you know, stakeholders, AIDOs, um, management at the district you know, level, farmers, so that we have this knowledge-based, evidence-based decision-making on where we could promote the certain you know, technologies and where there's our gaps are in terms of either technology adoption or you know, extension services or where we are not you know, seeing something. Lastly, on implementation, follow-up, and monitoring you know, capacity. Um, a lot of this you know, programs and a lot of these approaches and tools are good on their own. There are good you know, methods. 
but often it's the implementation that's the problem. Even though it's an approach uh, uh, that is good, uh, if it's not implemented you know, properly, we don't see any impact on the ground. And capacity strengthening in the implementation and monitoring, you know, I would you know, say because of the pluralism, it's a joint you know, responsibility by the public, public sector and private you know, sector. So I you know, see, in addition to that, still lack of you know, systems coordination, that we are not you know, seeing public sector, uh, private sector, non-NGO uh, um, NGOs working together, not you know, seeing each other as you know, competitors, but as you know, partners. We are not you know, seeing that. And this is a huge you know, role of you know, the government. If they could invest, if you could you know, invest in coordination you know, capacity, that would you know, do a good job in coordinating this pluralistic you know, discussion. Coordination, if there are active DAECs, they could do the job. Uh, in, in some of the active you know, DAECs, you know, they're doing the coordination at the district you know, level. But again, as I've said, these are pockets of successes. They are more of exemptions rather than the rule. So there's still a lot of you know, challenges in relying on the DECs in, in coordinating uh, extension service provision at the district. We could think of innovation platforms. If we organize ourselves within common interests of you know, certain you know, value chains, can we start you know, doing that and do uh, common you know, targets surrounding you know, value chains? and work you know, together, uh, uh, private sector, government, research you know, organizations, extension agents, to really you know, do um, some you know, impact, to really deliver impacts, to uh, advance the different you know, value chains. From the demand you know, side, as I've shown you know, earlier, that um, not a lot of you know, farmers are requesting information. 12% in 2016 and decline 4% in 2018. Radio you know, coverage is high, um, which is you know, good, but only s a few households uh, are members of listening club or ICT hubs you know, so far, 2% at the national level. And uh, uh, not so many are still using the text you know, messaging and call insert centers at the national level. When we did the focus group discussions, those who have used these services say they are very useful. It really um, helped them and it really responded to their needs. So how can we um, uh, promote this you know, demand you know, driven and demand uh, side you know, mechanisms? When we did the focus group discussions, you know, what uh, people and farmers you know, are saying is that we don't know about these services. We don't know that you can call for free to request information or voice your demands or raise your, your concerns about you know, certain uh, issues or um, certain you know, problems in the community or to rate or to provide you know, feedback on extension you know, services. They don't know yet about these you know, services. So greater community awareness and sensitization that there are these you know, services that exist could really be crucial so that more people can benefit from these you know, services. But also, we have to develop the capacity of the system, the ICT-based you know, demand you know, side mechanisms. It needs to be also strengthened so that you know, they could uh, uh, handle and manage all these calls, all these you know, demanders, all these requesters of information. So both sensitization and developing the capacity to manage this you know, demand articulation could be a strategy to move forward this demand side approaches to extension resources. So to summarize, um, we have you know, answered you know, some of you know, the questions. There are many more you know, questions. Uh, but what we are trying to emphasize is that we have to move from the input matrix. We have to move from the farmer to extension ratio, farmer to lead farmer you know, ratios. We have to move from counting the number of you know, trades we have to move at least at the out, uh, output you know, side, which is access to information you know, services. Access to information you know, services, 77% of the households in Malawi have this. It's high coverage in Malawi. It's, it's less of an issue. But what we need to strive is moving from the access to extension you know, services to really see 
impact of that information extension unit services to technology adoption and the many development outcomes that we are trying to achieve. So the question that we want you know, to raise to this you know, audience, we have answered you know, some of them, but it also you know, still has you know, a lot of remaining you know, questions. How can we translate this increased information to lead to behavioral change, to lead to technology adoption, and to lead to development in outcomes? How can we do these pockets of successes, this minority of functioning, uh, well-functioning uh, structures and, uh, and um, communities where they have you know, done you know, a good job in promoting and implementing these approaches. How can we accelerate that? What are the accelerators that we need so that we don't have you know, to wait for many years, but we can have you know, impact at a faster future? So my takeaway messages, I've said you know, so, uh, some of them already. Go beyond input matrix. Invest on implementing, uh, invest in capacity to implement and you know, to coordinate. That oftentimes is not the delivery method or approach that's the problem, but implementation or scaling up and monitoring of this you know, approach is the problem. We could focus on priority value chains. The NALIF as a guide can guide us on what are these you know, priority value chains that we can you know, invest on. So this could be a trigger. It could be an enabler for the public you know, sector, private sector, pri uh, and NGOs to be working you know, together because we would have you know, common interests, common targets towards uh, making sure that these value chains can really su be successful. The fourth is, as we have you know, seen in the different you know, effectiveness studies that we have done, that we have to do a lot more in terms of improving the content and quality of extension of your service. We could do a lot more in terms of farm demonstration because that's how we can you know, uh, motivate and encourage you know, farmers to see the full value of the technology. The fifth one is that we need a thorough review of this, you know, different you know, technologies and different you know, practices. That one location it might be beneficial, but other location it might not be beneficial. So we need to look at specifically each and every you know, technology and in practice and see where are they working and where they are not in working. And we could utilize ICT. There's data uh, you know, available on soil, climate. So we can interface and use those information to guide us where a technology would be working or not you know, be working. But it needs you know, collaboration with the researchers, the extension you know, agents, private you know, sector, NGOs, and the centrality of you know, farmers in reviewing this technology. We need to intensify the, the strengthening of the grassroots organizations. A lot of the structures that we are talking about work because of the grassroots <coughs> organizations that are strengthened, that are active, and really doing a good job in voicing and demanding the different uh, concerns that they have and mobilizing the people. That they need. ICT um, should be a part of the package of diverse extension approaches that we are using. Um, it's low cost, it can cover a lot of you know, uh, households, including the rural areas and the remote rural areas. The second, you know, to the last you know, point, is still we are in the project you know, based advisory services. That you know, we do a project, it works well because of artificial you know, incentives. We should really look you know, more closely at the sustainability. And lastly, a lot of your researchers, a lot of you are in the program, is you know, a plea and an encouragement that we should do more of this type of you know, evaluation. We could do um, so much in terms of you know, the data that we have, but we could do a lot more of experimentation, a lot of evaluation. You are implementing the projects. These are you know, the areas or opportunities where you could experiment on design you know, features or experiment on if you tweak you know, something in your design, Tweak you know, something in your extension you know, services. Can you make higher impact? Can it lead to higher impact? So this experimentation, in experimentation can be done. Three economists, Duclo, Kramer, and uh, Banerjee, have just you know, won the Nobel Prize of Economics because of this experimentation, social experimentation that they did. Because only when you control you know, things and do this in an experiment that you can see which one's working, which is not you know, working. 
So jointly we can do this and learn from this experience. With that, I thank our our uh, funders, um, Government of Flanders, um, GIZ, um, SANE, USAID, for providing us the opportunity, the platform, to um, collect you know the data, analyze the data, and provide you know useful you know feedback on how the system is working. And hopefully, we can take these messages you know, forward and really do uh, changes or improvements in how we do things, both at the public sector and non-government you know, uh, uh, sector. I thank you know, our partners in Luanar for all the support uh, in the analysis. I thank our uh, partner, Wadonda Consul at the Chancellor College, particularly Dr. You know, uh, Peter Ambula, and the late Ephraim um, Chirwood. So he has been a very instrumental you know, partner for us. We really miss him. And um, we, we are indebted for the attention to quality that he has in terms of data, research, and teaching. Lastly, I want to thank everyone because we have collected the data from you. We have spoken with you. We have discussed you know, these you know, issues with you. And the different communities different you know, farmers that we have taken their time to answer to our questions so that we have you know, something to work with, so that we have you know, something to analyze and uh, show uh, our you know, impacts. And you know, we are hoping that we will also do, we have done already a series of, of uh, providing this knowledge, providing these results to them. Actually, we're doing a lot with SANE going back to the districts, going back to some of the villages, and presenting our results you know, to them. And it's mind you know, blowing with them, uh, to them. It's very surprising with them, and it's very, they are very appreciative of the fact that it has never been done you know, before, that a lot of you know, people are collecting information from them, survey after survey, but never have, never have heard of anything from, from those you know, surveys. So it, it's very much you know, appreciated in the communities that we are taking back whatever result it is so that they can validate it, they can learn from those you know, experiences. Lastly, I'm also indebted to my research assistants and graduate students who helped us you know, analyze the data. We're still not done, we have analyzed some, but we have still several reports and papers that we have to, that we have you know, to complete. Two of them already finished their PhD and master's uh, you know, program using the data set that we have and doing the analysis you know, for the project. That has been you know, a very cost-effective way of analyzing the data, and four of them are finishing. So in summary, I think we're learning a lot from the data. There are several surprises for me, and I'm very much you know, excited and very happy to be part of this process and hopefully our lessons, our findings, can be lessons for you to take you know, forward to your organization. And I just uh, hope that you know, in the next you know, three years, five years, when I continue to work in Malawi, that something has happened or some of our you know, findings has been uh, taken up. So with that, I look forward to the dialogues. I look forward to debates. I look forward to validating the results wherever it's making sense or not making sense. I look forward to the explanations. Why are we seeing this you know, result? I look forward to the discussion, and I'll end there, and uh, uh, I'll talk you know, to, to you more uh, for the rest of the morning. Thank you.